Good afternoon. My name is Ramaya Krishnan. I am the Dean of the Heinz College of Information Systems and Public Policy at Carnegie Mellon University and the director of its Block Center for Technology and Society. And it is my pleasure to welcome everyone to this final panel on the National Security Commission's groundbreaking report on a national strategy for artificial intelligence. This panel, building a 2021 workforce with AI, calls attention to the NSC AI's report's focus on the importance of talent as a foundation for the AI strategy for the nation. While the report makes a compelling case for the digital transformation of the US government and for our nation to be AI ready by 2025, it states the following. The artificial intelligence competition will not be won by the side with the best technology. It will be won by the side with the best, most diverse and tech savvy talent. The report outlines the challenge of addressing the talent deficit in government by requiring an all of society or an all of nation approach to address this talent deficit. And it's really a system of systems approach that is being called for in this report. We have three distinguished panelists who will help us unpack and discuss some of the key challenges and recommended solutions to enable us to win this competition. I will introduce our panelists and in, or, and in the order in which they'll offer their opening remarks. Dr. Yosei Mary Griffiths, president of Dakota State University in Madison, South Dakota. She's a commissioner with the NSC AI. And Dr. Griffiths uh, chaired the workforce subcommittee of the National uh, Security Commission uh, on AI. Among her many contributions, she served in the National Science Board and has received multiple awards, um, including awards for the advancement of uh, women in these fields. Dr. Belinda Miles, president of Westchester Community College and an advisory board member of the Block Center for Technology and Society. Dr. Miles serves as president of the largest college in Westchester County, New York, one of the nation's largest metropolitan regions. The college educates and trains more than 26,000 students in credit and non-credit programs and is the State University of New York's first Hispanic serving institution. She's a recognized thought leader on community colleges as a disruptive innovation in academia that fosters an equitable and inclusive democracy. Professor Dr. Majid Sakar, professor in our School of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon and also a faculty associate at the Block Center for Technology and Society. Dr. Sakar is a professor in the School of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon University. He also serves as a co-director of the Masters of the Computational Data Science Program and has led many, many innovations at uh, Carnegie Mellon University, Qatar, as well as at our campus right here in Pittsburgh, and is leading a very innovative program uh, with local community colleges in imparting AI-relevant technology education. Let me begin our panel by first inviting Dr. Yosei Mary Griffiths to offer her comments. Dr. Griffiths. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Krishnan. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, first, I'd like to thank Carnegie Mellon University and the Block Center for hosting and, and inviting me to participate in today's panel discussion. CMU has been a critical partner for NSCAI since its inception, and we are very grateful for that partnership. The Commission worked in close collaboration with the Congress, the White House, and executive departments and agencies to develop its assessments and final recommendations. Our goal was to produce a comprehensive and enduring national approach to maintain America's AI advantages and to strengthen US national security. The commission consulted a wide range of experts inside and outside of the government on AI acquisition and development and its responsible adoption. So we're proud of the commission's bipartisan work 
we've debated together, learned together, and achieved consensus on critical points. Our report considers where the US stands on AI compared to its primary competitors and presents the first steps the United States should take to defend, compete, and win in the AI era. The Commission reached its final report, released the final report this past March, and it contains a variety of recommendations and judgments that the Commission found necessary to address. I'd like to point out two of them specifically. First, right now, our government is neither organized or resourced to win the technology competition against a committed competitor, and nor is it prepared to defend against AI-enabled threats. And second, the nation must get organized now and be resourced in order to be AI ready by 2025. So shifting from judgments to recommendations, the NSCAI final report focuses on four pillars of action, leadership, hardware, innovation, and talent. And today's conversation will focus on that fourth pillar, talent. As a nation and as a US government, we have a huge talent deficit. We need to build new talent and expand existing programs in government. We want to develop and expand our domestic talent, and we want the world's best researchers, engineers, and entrepreneurs to come, stay, and cultivate their talent in the United States. The technology competition is also a competition for global talent, and we need to think beyond incremental moves. In government, we need career paths for digital experts. Technologists should be able to spend their entire career focused on their fields of expertise. We must create career fields in software development, data science, and artificial intelligence, as well as develop department level digital core, C-O-R-P-S core. We must build new talent pipelines from scratch. We need talent to buy, build, and use AI technology. We feel the US should establish a civilian national reserve digital core and create a pipeline of tech talent into the government through a US digital service academy. For national competitiveness, we believe we must pass the National Defense Education Act number two. The demand for AI talent and proficiency is expanding across all sectors. We must deepen our domestic talent pool accordingly through K through 12 STEM education, undergraduate and graduate fellowships, reskilling initiatives, and stronger pathways to attract and retain high-skilled immigrants. In conclusion, the commission has proposed a series of bold critical moves to maintain US leadership in AI talent, but we need your help to make our recommendations a reality and there's still so much more to do. My fellow panelists, have deep experience in democratizing access to AI education through their leadership roles at Westchester Community College and Carnegie Mellon University. So I look forward to learning from them and sharing my experience developing new digital training programs at Dakota State University. In closing, building the future of the AI workforce requires all elements of society across government, industry, and academia and each of you listening today has an important role to play. With that, I thank you again to Carnegie Mellon for hosting this session. And I really look forward to our conversation this afternoon. Thank you. Let me um, invite Dr. Miles now to offer her comments. Thank you so much, Dr. Krishnan, and good afternoon, everyone. Congratulations, Dr. Griffiths, on the work of the commission and this really groundbreaking report, which challenges us as well as informs us. It's a call to action, and I'm, I'm pleased to join the conversation. Uh, I have been at Westchester Community College as president for seven years. We are celebrating our 75th anniversary, which is young in the world of higher education, but longstanding for community colleges. You heard in my uh, introduction that we uh, think of ourselves as a disruptive innovation in higher education where there had been traditionally four-year institutions uh, prior to our, our being formed uh, early in the 20th century. 
and uh, the disruption was caused by uh, uh, providing more broad access and affordability, allowing people who were uh, limited to their locality or had other commitments to access academia and higher education. Uh, Westchester Community College is one of the 30 community colleges in the State University of New York system. And we're about, and we're one of more than 1,100 community colleges across the United States, representing every state. And so again, that access is something that we are able to provide. And the disruption is because we don't often think of higher education as a commodity, but we were able to invite new consumers into the world of learning locally. Those were place bound again with families and other commitments. The President's Commission on Higher Education, often referred to as the Truman Report of 1947, describes community colleges as places that remove geographic and economic barriers to educational opportunity and discover and develop individual talents at low cost and easy access. Currently, more than 12 million students are enrolled in our nation's community colleges. This is according to information on the American Association of Community Colleges uh, website. That's 41% of the nation's undergrads that are studying at community colleges and having that access. And so that's not bad for the new kid on the block. 33% of our students are uh, receive Pell Grant funds. So that tells you a little bit about the importance of access through affordability. 27% are Latinx and 13% are African-American. So that's about 40% of individuals who may have been historically underrepresented in more traditional uh, academic environments. And so the nation is looking at community colleges as a vibrant and vital resource for keeping the door open to develop all of our talent as we look at current and emerging workforce demands. And uh, initially community colleges were thought of primarily for the first two years, as the first two years of college when we look at the very earliest of, um, of institutions. So the transfer mission to baccalaureate study remains critically important as uh, students begin with us and then go on to pursue professional or STEM careers uh, at the four year level. 19.5% uh, of master's degree earners and 10 uh, about 11% of doctoral research degree earners entered higher education at a community college. And that's according to the National Student Clearinghouse Research Center, which tracks the long-term of, of attendance of students in higher education. But we also have a very long history of career and technical education, responding to regional and local employment demands, as well as other urgent needs of the nation. One example that is particularly noteworthy is the United States Department of Labor's Trade Adjustment Assistant Community College and Career Training Act. And this program uh, was an, uh, began uh, in around 2014. And it was a grant that was a major investment to increase the ability of community colleges to address workforce needs in five key areas, energy, transportation, IT, advanced manufacturing, and healthcare. And $1.9 billion was awarded over a four-year period, and during which time nearly a half million individuals were enrolled and 351,000 credentials were awarded. And so that was very exciting to see how an infusion and how public policy could leverage the resource of our nation's community college to address certain key areas uh, that could uh, benefit from people receiving certifications and developing middle skills talent. At Westchester Community College in 2015, we received funding from the J.P. Morgan Chase uh, Foundation to uh, fund a study on middle skills careers in the lower Hudson Valley where we're located. And of course, middle skills are those uh, skills that uh, require more than the high school credential, but not quite the baccalaureate. And the middle skills in particular led to good entry level wages and also had a career path that often required more, more study over time. And so it was um, exciting to be a part of that initiative uh, to help 
um, to help individuals earn family sustaining wages. At Westchester Community College, we're also one of nine community colleges designated as a center for academic excellence in cyber defense. And we have several National Science Foundation advanced technology education grants that feature local partnerships with business and industry, STEM focused curricula for undergraduate research. So we uh, are very grateful for the focus of, of government entities to make the investment in our institutions to develop talent. So we're all in when it comes to looking at what's needed in the area of, of uh, artificial um, intelligence and automation. I'm very excited about the renewed focus on community colleges in addressing workforce readiness. We have a lot to contribute to the fourth industrial revolution, which is what we're talking about here. And uh, that includes the ability to embed across our general edu education core curriculum, a focus on digital literacy, because it is becoming ubiquitous across all of our disciplines. And we believe that it has great potential to unify a career in technical education with our liberal education foundations. So I'm very delighted to uh, be a part of today's panel and look forward to our discussion. I thank the Block Center for the work that you're doing and for the invitation to join you today. Back to you, Krishna. Thank you, Dr. Miles. Um, let me now invite Dr. Majid Sakar uh, to offer his insights and comments. Thank you, Krishnan, and thank you, Dr. Griffith and Dr. Miles for setting up what I'm about to say so well. I'm going to share a couple of slides as a good computer scientist, so please bear with me as I get my slides up. So um, it, is, it is pretty clear at this stage that uh, there is a gap between the demand and supply, and there will continue to be a gap between the demand and supply in terms of the AI workforce. And that is something that we all have to uh, invest effort so that we can address. But what does this uh, AI workforce look like? And what does this AI workforce stack look like? And obviously, there are the PhD level innovators that are inventing new techniques and new algorithms, as well as making existing techniques more accurate and more efficient. And there are the engineers who are um, able to develop custom uh, AI and ML models for specific applications. But we should also keep in mind, especially as we uh, communicate with industry and with government agencies, uh, that there is a large need that is unmet and, and uh, there will be a big gap uh, to have uh, developers and deployers of AI and ML. And those are individuals that can integrate the existing uh, AI tools um, within the applications that they build. Uh, and then there is a, also a large need for uh, AI and ML users and technicians. And those are the individuals who will have to uh, leverage AI as they make daily decisions. Uh, and they will also have to uh, maintain AI. So as we see and look at the AI uh, workforce stack, we see that there's uh, a, a different and complementary set of skills that we have to target as we uh, hope to uh, train those. And today I'd like to focus on ideas that we can uh, adopt so that we can increase the number uh, of uh, AI ML developers and deployers as well as users uh, and technicians. So um, we have to leverage on the job training much better than what we currently do. And uh, for that to happen, we have to design practical training pathways that are well integrated within an individual's job responsibilities. Asking them to get extra certifications is not necessarily uh, an effective uh, method. And uh, we need to do that in a way where the HR practices also evolve, where they recognize that that time invested in developing their skills uh, is not time taken away from their current productivity, it's time invested in their future productivity. And of course, we have to provide enough incentives so that individuals uh, will jump on this. And as, as we heard, uh, Dr. Miles, we have to leverage the large uh, network of community colleges out there. The community colleges have evolved so that they can meet the demands of a diverse group of learners. 
So they offer a variety of degree and non-degree programs and their modalities are also very flexible. They have synchronous, asynchronous offerings, in-person, hybrid and remote. And on the, on the way, they also enable industry certification so that these individuals are credentialed and, and are able to get the interview and eventually the job. Um, uh, Dr. Miles already alluded to this. There are 1,100 community colleges with 11 million learners. Uh, the demographics match that of the nation. Uh, and they have existing relationships with the learner and with the employer. And they have deep knowledge into the local and regional context that we ought to leverage um, when, when we are talking about uh, that training uh, approach. So what can we do? Well, there's a lot for us to do. We have to think about centers of excellence and, 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 uh, and other approaches so that we can uh, grow this relationship. And, and a part of it requires uh, a direct and intentional collaboration with those community colleges where together we co-design and co-develop uh, programs and curricula in these emerging uh, areas. And we have to adopt what the learning science tells us uh, about uh, effective methods uh, pedagogical methods such as project-based learning and, and others. Um, there's a lot of discussion on training the trainer and, and, and I'm all for it, but it's not just in the, in the domain of expertise. We should also consider training the trainer and culturally responsive teaching and data informed teaching as well. And we, uh, since these trainers are now teaching project-based courses, we can't just train them and let them be on their own. We also have to provide support so that as they are teaching these courses, when they encounter difficulties, they can get our help. Um, we are pitching uh, AI and ML and automation and analytics. We also have to leverage those techniques so that we can scale and improve the uh, uh, effectiveness and efficiency of the, of the trainer. Uh, by, by leveraging these models. I'm gonna show you an example uh, of that in a second. Um, and also we have to uh, be cognizant that we uh, need to enable uh, the, the customization of our offerings for, for that particular region. And we must not forget that all of these community colleges are, uh, are fantastic partners for our research studies and for, for the proposals that, that we put forward. So what is an example of, of data-informed teaching? And I just want to show you here uh, one dashboard, uh, one view uh, in, in our, in our uh, sales sale stands for social and interactive learning platform dashboard, where an instructor can see on a daily basis the level of activity that the learners have, have done, and they can see the number of submissions they are making per day, and then uh, an anonymized fabulous crocodile here is highlighted. One of the students, we can see the number of hours they have spent and where they are compared to the rest of the class when it comes to uh, how many times they're submitting, what is their score, how many hours they are investing, uh, so on and so forth. So uh, there's a lot of data for us to visualize. And this data is also a rich opportunity for us to leverage as we build our uh, AI models that can also take advantage of this. With that, I'd like to conclude and I look forward to the conversation um, and, and the outcomes uh, of this panel. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sarkar. If I might request my panelists uh, to join me. Uh, th thank you all for um, wonderful context setting remarks. Um, this gives us, um, you know, sets the stage for a really, um, what I hope to be a really engrossing uh, discussion. Um, let me um, begin by asking, um, Dr. Griffiths, um, a, a question that is specific to the report, which has to do with why does the government need AI talent and why is it so much of a challenge to recruit this talent? It's a, a very good question. Um, the first thing I should do is just remind you we were the National Security Commission so uh, our, our primary focus was on uh, how to ensure the security of the United States in an AI enabled world. But we also felt it was important also to address the issue of um, uh, how we can leverage innovation and maintain leadership in science and technology as the US, as the US has done for many, many years. So um, 
it was very, very interesting proceeding through the interactions that we had as a commission. And every different work group kept coming back to issues of talent. Um, you really can't do any of the recommendations unless the talent exists, whether it exists in government or the private sector or in academia. So that's the first thing. We think that uh, an AI capable workforce in the United States is very, very important. And if we don't have one, we're simply just going to fall behind. We'll stay stagnant. If our government doesn't have the right AI talent, it won't know what technology to buy, how to use it, in, how to buy it intelligently, how to build systems, how to integrate systems, and how to use the AI it has um, acquired or built. And we found that a lack of AI talent has led to a lot of wasted time, wasted money, lost opportunities for our agencies, slower and less efficiency of, of uh, services to the American people. There are some islands within the federal government and within the military that are moving quickly, but it's not enough and it's not systemic enough to uh, make the kind of uh, wholesale change that we anticipate. So many see the government as an overly bureaucratic, the federal government as an overly bureaucratic organization that slows innovation. It uses antiquated software and hardware that almost always lags behind the private sector. And of course, what young people are attracted to is to work with the newest and coolest tools. Um, the hiring process is very difficult. Hiring timelines are so slow that many people find multiple non-government job opportunities. They interview them, they get offers in the time it takes to get a single interview with the government. My daughter recently waited two years for her government application to go through. Fortunately, it came through. <laughs> but the workforce demands exceed supply. Last year, there were more than 430,000 computer science jobs open in the United States and only, only 71,000 graduates from American universities. And the market's even more competitive for AI than computer science generally. And that demand is growing and the acceleration of the demand is also growing. So really um, the government, if it doesn't do something is simply going to fall behind as the talent flows to the private sector. It actually flows away from the academic sector too, by the way, um, and we'll all be falling behind. So it seems to, to me um, and to my colleagues, we need a multi-pronged approach. We need to build pipelines. So we're not just dealing with people coming into our doors, be it a community college or a university. We need upskilling and reskilling programs clearly, and as has been described by um, Dr. Miles and Dr. Sucker, we need to develop and retain the domestic talent, and we need to attract and retain the international talent. So it's a multi-pronged approach that I think is very, very important. I want to mention one other thing, if I could, and it may be, um, it, you know, I will, I will address some of these issues, both from the, from the perspective of the commission, from the perspective of my university, but if you, uh, if you noticed on the uh, national map of community colleges that Dr. Sucker pre pre presented, there were no community colleges in South Dakota where I am. And that's because the public universities function uh, as a community college as well by offering the associate degree level. So um, I, I work uh, offering um, associate degrees and then down into the technical colleges and the technical institutes we have in the state and then down into K through 12. So I'm very, very familiar with some of the issues that you talked about, Dr. Miles, um, and uh, I look forward to our conversation generally. But I think the, th the theme that ran through our whole commission from beginning to end was there is an urgency. We can't sit back and wait. We can't wait to do one thing and then another and then another in an incremental way. We can't wait to make decisions. We have to move and we have to move quickly. And 2025, was the timeline we set because it's also been set by other countries. 20, how can we have an AI capable workforce in the federal government and in the United States by 2025? And it's not that far off and it's coming at us very quickly. Um, there's so much to unpack uh, in, in what you said and uh, thank you for, for that comprehensive response. Uh, if you might pick up on um, the first uh, aspect uh, of what the government has to do internally uh, to set up um, the capabilities to define, you mentioned career fields um, that have to exist within the government. Um, the, the, the report in particular seems to call for 
additional fields in areas like software engineering, software management, knowledge management, and artificial intelligence. Um, and in much of the uh, interactions that we have had, we find that in addition to the technologists, there's also a need for people who understand how to take technology to solve business or policy implementation problems. For instance, at the Heinz College where I'm Dean, we, um, we cross-train students in policy and data analytics. Um, so as you, as you think about these career fields, and then we can talk about the pipelines in terms of how to get people into those career fields. Was there thought given to both the technology fields as well as fields that span technology and application areas? Yes, absolutely. We did. We looked at uh, not just at the sort of hardcore technical technical needs, technological needs through the stack, as it were, as Dr. Saka sort of listed them, but also how can you apply uh, AI in, in a variety of areas. And as we talked about things like ethics and responsible use, uh, policy uh, became a big issue. Uh, advocacy became another issue. Um, education is another issue. So we see these needs cutting across many, many different segments of society with the accompanying educational requirements as well. Thank you. Um, if I might, um... Uh, turn to the, the topic of pipelines, which you mentioned. Um, that brings directly into question, how might we build domestic pipelines? Let's focus on domestic pipelines first, um, both from universities and, and community colleges. Um, the report calls for um, creating a, a digital services academy. Um, could you say a few words about the vision for that uh, for that academy as envisioned in that report? And then we could use that as a jumping off point to think about other ways of perhaps uh, realizing the objective. Certainly. Um, the Digital Services Academy was one of our bolder recommendations. It was that we create something uh, similar to West Point, the Air Force Academy, the Naval Academy, but for digital, so digital sciences generally. So in other words, creating a new university that would educate uh, groups of young people in sort of cohort kinds of models. Um, the idea was that this would be a services academy that would be a, an accredited academic institution with the appropriate um, technological career fields identified, but also very heavily containing the, um, the liberal arts programs uh, and, and support that's needed for people to be successful in the long term. We compared that with the idea of, well, maybe we should have a network of universities around the United States that would connect and would all educate people that would then go into the federal government. And we have that. We made recommendations about increasing the scholarship for service programs, the ones in STEM and the ones in cybersecurity and expanding them to AI and related fields. But we felt that what was needed was at least one institution that would pull together the cohort of people that would have a, uh, an identical experience that would graduate together and would move into the government, the civilian side of the government, I should say this is not for the military, the civilian side of government as a cohort and become the leaders of the future in terms of promoting the use of digital technologies and the development of them within the civilian government. And uh, that was the approach. As I said, we went back and forth, but we feel this was a very, very important uh, recommendation to go. And one of the more, I would say almost, at first I would have said maybe controversial, but I think one of the more popular ones. There's a lot of people in, in Congress, the White House, academic institutions are very interested in. Uh, thank you, Dr. Griffiths. If, if I might invite Dr. Miles to uh, speak to this question of um, you know, the pipeline, um, I mean, Dr. Griffiths just mentioned the network of universities, and um, you had mentioned, you know, more than 1,100 community colleges that are out there, in addition to other four-year colleges. What, 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 what would you think about how to, um, how would community colleges contribute uh, to this mission of um, growing the uh, workforce and getting more domestic, the domestic pipeline delivering more students with the capabilities required by the government? So I want to first um, acknowledge the slide that uh, Dr. Sacker had on his, in, in his slide deck 
that revealed sort of the pyramid structure that showed that there were different strata of technologists and experts that would be needed with technologists kind of looming at the base of that. And so that suggests to me that the, um, the service academy model is certainly an excellent way to produce uh, in a certain timeline the kinds of uh, professionals that are needed, but a more distributed model could, could leverage the existing community college network, certainly, uh, the, in order to, to fulfill some of the, uh, the, the, the broader needs that, that will be evident. And so the service, uh, the service academy model, in my opinion, becomes the tip of the iceberg. And so there's so much at the base of that iceberg that can't be neglected when we look at the volume of, uh, of talent that must be produced. And I'll share with you some information that I, I read about in a 2019 President's Report uh, from Lumina, Pre Lumina Foundation President Jamie Meritosis. He stated that 99 million Americans, more than half of the nation's working age population, age 25 to 64, hold no credential beyond the high school diploma. That's a lot of people. And he challenged us to think of the economic and societal progress that would be unleashed if even a fraction of this group took that step and earned a certificate or certification. When you parallel that to those who have been displaced during our current global pandemic, uh, we know that there's a mismatch often between the skills, the jobs that were vacated and the places where there will be talent needed. So a distributed model will allow um, uh, our various regions and existing institutions to help more people. It, it has that democratic ideal of providing access more broadly to get more people in. Because I do believe that, again, while the service uh, the, uh, academy model has lots of merit, it would have too few individuals too slowly to meet the demand of the 2025 timeline. Thank you, Dr. Miles. One other thing that comes to mind, Dr. Griffiths, as you, as you mentioned, the scholarship for service type of model is, given the, the trillion do, more than a trillion dollars of student debt uh, that currently exists, um, having a, a way for students to come out debt-free uh, following their education and in return be able to serve the nation by serving in government seems like a really um, an, a model that might align incentives get, to get students to engage either in the distributed model or in a model uh, of the Digital Services Academy to get students to want to participate in this, uh, in this, um, in this pipeline building activity. Um, yes, yes, you're absolutely right. This is one of our earlier recommendations was in fact to uh, double the size of the scholarship for service models um, at the opportunity and the the digital services academy also was um, was was free to the student. Um, and the cost, by the way, is very similar. So that's why we felt we could add this new model um, of digital services academy. But the other thing we felt very strongly, I had long discussions. And, and I believe is why the community college connection is very, very important. We felt both the service academy and other pathways, such as through community colleges, would expand the diversity of the resulting uh, qualified population. Um, we feel that uh, we're not doing a very good job in this country of diversifying the workforce. I'll acknowledge Carnegie Mellon having done so well in uh, uh, equalizing its uh, computer science programs to some degree. But again, it's a model that has not been replicated in very many other places, and we need to do that. So we need young people, first generation students, um, students who, um, who are out from low income uh, homes, who are unable to afford a four year degree. And we need, I think, two forms of pathways. Um, so we've been working, this now is Dakota State University, on a pathway if you like, towards careers, a, a more traditional pathway from high school to community college to university. But we've created a system where people can accumulate credits, academic credits, and carry them and go in and out of the workforce as they like, carrying their basket of credits with them so that when they're ready, they can move on to the next stage in their education. That's the, the much more traditional uh, pathway that exists for people. We're now in, actively in development of of the uh, workforce training, reskilling, upskilling, 
uh, on the job training kind of program where we're placing young people into apprenticeships. We're bringing, taking existing workers and giving them additional credentials. And for that, we're developing a series of micro credentials that also have some cumulative effect because I don't think you want to just say, well, here's the mass of everything, pick what you want. Um, there's something in education that allows us to frame and form and build on uh, prior knowledge and skills development. So I think I see two different pathways towards the variety of careers that exist today and that don't exist today, but will exist a for credit and a not for credit. And the key is at what point would people be able to transition from one to the other? And how would we be able to do that? So that's when you get into credit for prior experience and credit for other things done. Uh, these are the, all the things that not only are academic institutions through higher education discussing, but so are our accrediting bodies having serious conversations about. You know, bo both what you and Dr. Miles have spoken about directly speak to the need for what Dr. Sacker spoke about. So I'd like to invite him um, because I think the assumption that we that our universities and our community colleges have the capacity uh, to deliver the pipeline um, is something that I'd love for him to comment on because some of the work that he's doing is truly innovative at building up that capacity and also being able to scale that uh, through technology. Dr. Sacker, um, if you could comment on you know, the pipeline and how one might make it more robust and deliver verifiable competencies, but do it at scale. Yeah, those are uh, uh, very challenging uh, uh, topics, of course. Um, it is good for us to recognize first that these domains are evolving very quickly. And so they are changing as we are training individuals in these domains. And for them to remain relevant, we have to make that requirement um, uh, at, as, as a first class citizen, so that we don't just say, we're going to design curricula, we're going to train the trainer, hand it over, and that's it, our job is done. Uh, we have to keep in mind that the domains are evolving rapidly and our relationship with the partner needs to be an intentional one where it, it's a true collaboration. So that means that we cannot just uh, say what emerging domains do we need to develop uh, training in and let's, let's go after it. We also have to consider that our methodologies need to evolve and as AI is improving, our uh, adoption of AI as a partner for the instructor to make them more effective and efficient mm -hmm. is also something that we have to consider and incorporate in our ideas. So how do we achieve all of this at once? This uh, immediately starts to lead to the discussion that there has to be an ongoing collaboration between uh, ourselves and, and the, the various community colleges that are out there. Mm -hmm. And we, we have to create this, um, this relationship and this collaboration so that it is ongoing and enduring. And once we do that, then we can start to say, uh, what are effective techniques that are, uh, that are proving to be applicable to a particular context? And how can we then try to replicate that to another context? How can we um, take some emerging AI models and deploy them uh, in, certain, uh, 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 in certain learning uh, pathways so that we can make the instructor more effective. So I'll just give you one example. Identifying at-risk students early is, is, uh, could, could be a major differentiator between success and dropping out. And so when, it's, when we're asking instructors to teach a large number of, of, uh, of classes and they are teaching uh, also uh, several classes every semester, it's hard for the instructor to have that high touch relationship that we hope for. So then we ought to augment what they do by leveraging AI so that we can analyze the behavior, the interaction of the learner and identify at-risk students early so that the instructor can then trigger uh, interventions or take action and then hopefully address some of the issues of that learner. There are other issues that we have to think about collaboratively as well, which is STEM ID 
STEM identity and belonging. We have to also think about self-efficacy and culturally responsive teaching is, is something that is not a nice to have. It's something that we have to uh, be a lot more intentional about. And, and so we have thousands of instructors and they need a lot of professional development in these domains so that they can help us build this pipeline. And, and I think through this rich collaborative activity, then we can say we are attempting to, to uh, address this. So I would caution us from not thinking that one program, we develop curricula, we deploy it, and we call it done. This has to be an ongoing effort. It has to be an ongoing collaboration so that we can sustain this. And as the technology and the content evolve, we are able to react to them as well. Majid, uh, that sets up very nicely a pivot to uh, another bold recommendation from the report, which calls for a digital reserve core, uh, which goes beyond the, the service academy to basically have um, people in the private sector, the social sector, the university sector, um, to spend um, time um, coming in, much like the, the ROTC and the reserve corps, National Guard um, are able to sort of keep, um, uh, be the be the reserve to help the the active duty forces. Um, so uh, I'd like to um, first get have Dr. Griffiths comment on the vision for that, and then I'd love to have Dr. Sacker say a few words about that's the, the the nature of the training. Is it very going to be very different for that group versus the pipeline? And then what role can community colleges play for that group as well, because of the the national distribution of uh, the folks from the Reserve Corps. So Dr. Griffiths, if you could set the context for the Reserve Corps idea, which I found really exciting. Um, I think what, where we started with this was where does the talent exist today? And it doesn't exist in the government and the federal government doesn't exist in, through any, any level of government, quite frankly. So the talent is predominantly in the university sector and in the um, private sector. So how can the government uh, take advantage of that talent. So the first thing people started to say was, well, uh, people in the private sector don't want to work for the government, people in academia don't work, want to work for the government. But the thing is, if you give them interesting and challenging problems to solve, they want to get involved. And people indicated to us as we uh, conducted our research in, with private sector organizations and with uh, researchers in academia, there was a general sense that people get excited on ideas. They might not want to go into the government permanently, but they were certainly willing to put some service in to the government. So that's where the idea evolved. The model of the Reserve Corps is one that works quite well. You do about, you know, third, you know, about a little over a month a year uh, commitment. Um, the government would organize itself to say, we need uh, help in these areas, and then would go out and put out these uh, solicitations to uh, experts that exist in the other two sectors. The other thing that does is introduce more people to the problems and issues that the government has. And we also thought that with the, with the academics uh, developing those relationships, they would expose their students to some of those challenges and opportunities. And hopefully that might encourage some, some additional people to go perhaps directly into careers in the government. So it was a, a way to address um, a number of uh, potential problems that the government has, given that we really need to, to get as many people working on this for the government as possible, especially the upgrading of the environment within the government. And, and, and in terms of the, the skill sets for these folks, that in, in a, if I might use a word of being able to spend time, short durations, parachute in, if you will, and then the skill sets that they need, the scaffolding that they need to help them really be productive and effective when they play that role, that raises a new set of training challenges and opportunities. Um, and I would like Dr. Sacker to say a few words about that and then have Dr. Miles comment on that as well. Mm -hmm. um, so when we look at our existing outreach programs, um, and industries outreach programs, they leverage uh, a lot of existing um, engineers and practitioners in the domain that have a unique set of skills that we ask them to come in and engage with a variety of, of learners across the nation. 
And I think this model is quite similar to that. So people are quite uh, happy to give up uh, their time because they recognize that they are investing it in something meaningful. And so there's already a model and there, there is evidence that people are willing to, to uh, invest their time uh, to, uh, to address a need. So, but when it comes to the training that is needed for a particular problem that, that the government, and you need to put a quick team together um, that can help move it, then some, some micro training uh, uh, modules uh, that could be put together to uh, focus a variety set of experienced individuals so that they recognize what is the problem at hand, what are, what are the requirements, what are we trying to achieve, and so doing those and making them available so that we can uh, benefit from, from a large group of individuals and their deep experience, but at the same time focus them so that they can help uh, address the problem that is at hand. So that we can do this, uh, what you're describing, uh, Krishnan, is, is something that's, that's quite agile and, and that agility requires that scaffolding that you are describing as well so that we can do this effectively. Thank you, Majid. D Dr. Miles, um, community colleges could play a, a very useful role in this setting as well. Could you comment on that? Yes, um, and we've been looking at agile structures within our organizations as we've been, uh, as we've had to respond to the pandemic, as, a, as we're responding to uh, localized needs. And, and certainly I love the term system of systems. The agile environments are networks of networks. And so that's a, a good uh, use of the terms because it's very dynamic, it's very fluid, it's changing often, and, uh, and we have to be able to, to adapt. And so having, being able to train those trainers so that we have the infrastructure to offer what's needed, that there is some uh, sort of national curriculum or set of competencies that uh, we can, uh, I hate to say pull off the shelf, but that we can access. Uh, that would be uh, very important. I also think that the uh, comments about a per a personalized learning is going to be critical for uh, this kind of uh, di distributed model to ensure that there's consistency uh, across the various uh, units to keep people engaged and, and, and moving forward. And I also enjoyed the comments that uh, Dr. Griffiths made about moving in and out of different types of credentialing circumstances. We're already seeing that at the community college where we have the traditional degree-seeking students, but also students who are enrolled in short-term certification programs so that they are stopping out of their degree program to pick up a credential that might lead them to uh, either a different shift or a different opportunity in the workforce where they've upskilled and prepared for that. And sometimes they will go to an entirely different um, institution to, to pick up the uh, remaining parts of their um, associate degree. So something, again, that's very nimble, very fluid. And I do think that this speaks to the future of education uh, with regard to increased collaborations across systems and uh, increased challenges even for our accrediting bodies and our state systems to recognize credits that are transferring and the mobility patterns of students as they're seeking new opportunities. So it's all very complex, but we have to then take that 30,000 foot level to see how it connects to something meaningful. Uh, I think I heard the term sort of a bucket of credentials that is walking with the student, and that is the way the, uh, that's one of the big trends that we're seeing in a student uh, as a market, marketplace and their, their demands and their behaviors are shifting. And alongside that are the full range of holistic supports that we need to give to students. I appreciate, Dr. Sacker, the, um, the, uh, the commentary on at-risk students, how do we identify them. We can no longer say that those needs must be addressed outside of the academy or the training environment, but there has to be a recognition of, um, of how we can uh, provide and fund those types of uh, resources for those who need them because we can't afford to leave uh, masses of people behind that would then um, uh, reinforce inequities that we're trying to, um, to, to dissolve. You know, um, one of the wonderful things about a panel where we're having an engrossing discussion is that time flies. 
and we are uh, at the end of our, our, our end of our discussion. And I know there's so much more that that there is even on this topic of talent. Um, there's a the National De uh, Defense Education Act Part Two, um, which Dr. Griffiths mentioned at the outset, which envisions you, you know investments in K through 12 and supplemental programs and other such that we could have spent a whole hour on. Um, and then the issue of immigration uh, policy changes with regard to um, having uh, uh, PhDs with uh, STEM education, new kinds of visa categories for people with disruptive uh, technology innovation capabilities. Again, that would have taken a whole hour. So all this to say, I hope we have vetted your appetite and that you will actually read this wonderful ground, groundbreaking report of the National Security Commission uh, that has produced. Um, I've read it and I know all my colleagues have, and I um, uh, sort of strongly recommend uh, that you all have an opportunity to read it and then contribute to really making it a reality. Um, so um, with that, let me also take this opportunity because of, um, First, take this opportunity to thank all my uh, uh, colleagues on this panel, Dr. Griffiths, Dr. Miles, Dr. Sacker. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, it was a fabulous uh, being on this panel with you. And this being the, the final panel uh, of the series uh, with the National Security Commission, I really want to take this opportunity to thank all the commissioners and the staff uh, for their uh, amazing work for their national service, putting this uh, groundbreaking report together. And um, thank um, many people on the CMU team, all on the CMU team that have helped make this happen. Uh, Shane Shaneman and Kevin McGinnis in particular. Uh, and uh, have a wonderful evening and uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you again and take care. Bye-bye.